Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. I'm Yaz Rana and today I'm joined by former England batsman Mark Butcher, Telegraph writer, former Middlesex skipper and Wisdom Cricket Monthly columnist Izzy Westbury and magazine editor of Wisdom Cricket Monthly Joe Harmon. There is loads to talk about today, not all of it that straightforward. Um, so we'll, get, we'll just go straight into it. Um, so it all starts at Lords. Ollie Robinson enjoyed a fine debut on the field, but during his first day as a test cricketer, a range of racist and sexist tweets from 2012 and 2013 emerged after day one, Robinson issued an apology and after the test, the ECB announced that Robinson was suspended from international cricket pending the outcome of a disciplinary investigation. Then one day later on Monday, Wizen.com reported that another England cricketer had published a tweet containing racial slurs on their account shortly before their 16th birthday. Given his age, we didn't reveal the identity of the player. Other websites have reported the player also published a tweet that contained a homophobic slur at a similar age. Um, there's been quite a lot of coverage of, of both those stories. Uh, Joe, you didn't quite see the second story in the same way as our website team did. No, and I think it's important to separate the two, the Ollie Robinson scenario and, and what's come out in the last day or so. Um, yet, in short, I don't think we should have published that or Wisdom.com should have published that article. I think... The age of the player in question at the time that he sent those tweets is, is hugely problematic. So that would be immediately I'd have left it alone on that basis. Um, I think as also I think public interest, I think it's dubious on that front. Um, I can see it's topical, but whether that means it needed to be out there, I, I, I don't really agree with that either. And on a personal level, and this is this is very personal to me, as a cricket writer, I don't see it as my responsibility to report that kind of news. And that is different depending on the writer you are I work for a monthly magazine you and Ben work for a, a daily website which is breaking stories and, and have done a fantastic job in doing that and there has been some brave and courageous journalism over the last year or so under Ben's watch which has been great I think on this uh, in this instance uh, it's been a misstep uh, I know Ben's taken some flack today so I'm certainly not skewering him and it's a bit unfortunate he's not here because it seems a bit like I'm sticking one in when he's not around but I've spoken at Ben uh, spoken with Ben at, at length this morning and mm -hmm. you know it was a honest conversation and I think anyone who listens to the show knows what I think of Ben and I think he's, he's a great journalist but I do think in this instance um, it was a poor decision cool fair enough um, I'll, I'll give my view and, and another website's view um, we found the player's name we were not touring through every player's history but we, we found the tweet very very easily um, as soon as we found out about it. We alerted the ECB, it was taken down. I'd argue that if we hadn't, then uh, that tweet would have circulated and everyone would know who, who what, what the player tweeted historically. Um, mm. And you made a really important point. The age makes it a massive difference to the Robertson case. Um, but I think a couple of points I'd make around it is that, one, when school kids in their teens make comments like that publicly, not only can they be severely punished for it at school, I talked about teacher... I brought, talked to a teacher about this yesterday and he said that if a 15-year-old posted something like that, they would be severely punished. Um, but also the racism under 15s can face um, it, at school is some of the worst they can experience their lives. So, you know, kids are cruel. And I saw it first time when I was at school that um, the Jewish kids in my year, for example, had to deal with horrific comments that teachers didn't hear every day. Um, and we haven't named the player and it's on to the ECB to decide how to move on after we didn't pass a judgment one way or the other, um, it's very similar to a case that's happened in the Premier League recently. Uh, West Ham footballer Jared Bowen, um, he apologised, the club made a statement and everyone moved on quite quickly. I think you can be called out for things you've done when you're younger and forgiven for it. Um, but yeah, I completely get that it's a very, very complicated situation. Um, do either of you want to weigh into it before we move on? <laughs> I think that's sort of playing with fire to, to okay. weigh into it. But um, yeah, I think it is difficult I wouldn't want to make that call either way um, but one thing I would say I guess is that I feel I said this from the start with Robinson the Robinson saga is I don't think it's about any one player and it shouldn't be I you know I don't endorse cancel culture or anything um, it's it's more indicative of a wider attitude cultures in the game and I think there are more revelations being made of more recent social media posts as well which you know, you can start drawing lines as to what's racist and what's sexist, but there's obviously some problematic views that actually I just, I want to use this as an optimistic point 
a, a good turning point where instead of batting it away and deleting what's been done in the past, we have a conversation about why those views were thought to be okay and people were comfortable holding them, publicising them, and, and you know, make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm. Everyone can change. I, I think, you know, that, that was... I had, a, I had the um, tremendous fortune to uh, have my first live on-air conversation with a, uh, a, a twin set and pearl-wearing um, radio host... Um, with a hyphenated surname um, during the during the week after the you know who, who suddenly developed a very keen interest in the fortunes of the England cricket team and its players due to sort of sensing a, a culture war um, you know opportunity over the Ollie Robinson story um, and I was able to well I, I I don't know about talk her down but I kind of I, all I said was look the 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 course of action that has been taken, if you look at it in terms of what happens to the to the one individual, people will think it's harsh. People might think it's not harsh enough. But if you look at it in terms of, and this backs up a little bit what is is he saying, if you look at it in terms of the wider effort to kind of, you know, to, to improve people's um, understanding of, um, you know, what, what, what decent behaviour looks like, um, how hurtful racism and sexism, sexism and these things can be, and that if it takes you having to, to, to make an example of one individual in order to hammer that message home still further throughout not just the game but in, in, in life in general, public life, then that's a good thing. Hmm. Um, and it isn't about a witch hunt um, over, over the individual. It's a, England said it themselves, and this is where the, where the whole thing becomes more complicated to me is that you cannot, on the one hand, as an organisation, go out there and say, you know, this is, this is how we want to present ourselves and how, <laughs> how we want to behave and, and the, sort of, the sort of message that we're sending to our young fans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on one day, and then kind of turn a, bl- turn a blind eye to stuff that completely contradicts that on the next day. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the whole thing is unbelievably unfortunate. I cannot, you know, I can't... If, if my kids if my daughters kind of like would would were sending messages like that with that sort of language using those sorts of words you, you don't know what you'd do as a father you'd be pretty damn furious you'd be um and that's you know kids are cruel you're absolutely right mm. um should there be ramifications for comments made so long ago um i mean separating the two the, the robinson story has gained more traction the prime minister's uh, weighed in, another cabinet minister, Oliver Dowden, has said that the punishment is excessive. Is he, they've, they've misunderstood the nature of the suspension, right? And that's quite important to get Look, across. I mean, seriously, the, the, these, <laughs> those people are, are sort of advocating that you shouldn't punish people for the things that they've said in the past. Well, I wonder why that might be. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is also, I mean, there's, there's, there's two strands to it, isn't there? There's, first of all, they've, well, on the, on the outside, it looks as though they've misunderstood it because they, cause the ECB said that Ollie Robinson has been indefinitely suspended. Now, for those of us that follow the game and covering it closely and know what's going on, we know that that's because they're starting a process. It's going to the Cricket Discipline Commission. It's probably going to take them a couple of days to work out you know, the circumstances of the tweets. And then there'll be some kind of punishment, you'd assume. And to be honest, most of us are expecting a one-match ban, maybe, maybe, maybe a bit more because some people are really angry. Um, and that's fine. You, you know, you move on. I mean, I'm fully expecting him to play in the ashes, the way in which he bowled, to be honest. Um, so on the one hand, you could say, yeah, they just weighed in not knowing anything. But it was re- I listened to a chap called Matthew Dancona this morning on the radio who writes for The Tortoise. And um, he was uh, pretty explicit, actually, that this is a very calculated strategy um, by a politician like um, Boris Johnson, who, let's be honest, has, has risen up on the populist vote and, and uh, does kind of want to start some sort of a culture war and actually cricket. We're the pawns. <laughs> We're the proxies. Mm. Well, Ollie uh, Robinson I mean, at I, this I stage. And, and well, I mean, this is the last thing Ollie Robinson needs at this yeah. point yeah. to have, first of all, the culture secretary and then Boris Johnson sensing an opportunity weighing in here. It's absolutely the last thing he needs. Well, and, it, and it's solidified people on either side in a way that it might not have done uh, previously. Uh, and it's also going to make his comeback so much harder as a result because there's going to be interest. I mean, we always want to grab the interest of people who don't usually follow mm. cricket, but probably not in this way. This is generally how it goes, unfortunately. Well, you, can, suddenly you can guarantee that the interest of Ollie Robinson were not behind the Prime Minister wading in. No, no. I, I, I used the words culture wars <laughs> yeah. two minutes ago. I yeah. mean, that's, it's entirely what has happened. Entirely mm. what has happened. That's entirely why um, 
entirely why those, those people have, have weighed in. And we know this. I mean, you know this if you know. If you're paying attention, you know. Um, and, and the hope is for them that a lot of people aren't really paying attention and it just becomes another thing that, oh, you know, what a terrible country we live in. Mm. Um, that, you know, where people are, 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 are woke and lefty liberals all over the place trying to cancel everybody. Number one, being cancelled means you've been banned. If, imagine this. For the people who think that this whole thing is too harsh... The, the, the punishment meted out to Ollie Robinson. Imagine the ECB take him at his word that he's a changed man, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, second chances, and everybody wants to give people second chances. Imagine that they, you know, they take him at his word, the apology is accepted, and everybody moves on, and that in the intervening time between now and the first day of the next Test match, something else shows up, or somebody comes along to tell a, a harrowing story. And I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I hope sincerely that that isn't going to happen. And I'm pretty sure that it isn't. But if you don't check, and then that thing happens and breaks on day one of the next test match and Ollie Robinson is playing, all hell breaks loose, right? So or in Australia. Mm. So it's utterly, utterly correct that you give yourself a bit of time to sort through the whole thing, make sure, make sure that everything is tidied up and cleaned up, make your decision. He misses one test match against New Zealand, and then it, providing everything's okay, my feeling is his, his international career continues. Mm. And for those people who think it's too lenient, people who have been subjected to racist and sexist and, and God knows what, homophobic abuse through much of their lives and think, you know, this is just another case where it's, everything gets swept under the carpet and nothing really changes and nothing really happens. To me, that's where you say, well, okay, that's where the historical side of this thing comes in. There is a certain amount of len leniency and leeway given because this happened such a long time ago. Hmm. So as far as I'm concerned that they've done, you know, and, and I'm the first person to have a go at the EC, any organisation, basically, if I feel that they're, you know, they're missing, they're dropping the ball. On this case, I think they've got it right. I really, really do. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, any, anybody, that wants to, to, anybody that wants to jump on and make it a bigger thing than it is, is sensing an opportunity for a wider, uh, a, a wider sort of, uh, how would you call it? It's, it, it's, it's causing trouble. It's basically trying to kind of stick the knife in, to stir up the culture wars, to do all of these nefarious things that have been going on in this country for the last five or six years. Mm. Ad nauseum. O on the reaction within cricket, how much do you think the numerous allegations of racism within the game over the last year have played into the general reaction from not necessarily the ECB, but people within the game? So obviously Azeem, Rafiq's accusations of institutional racism at Yorkshire. This week, umpire John Holder dismissed ECB comments claiming he withdrew his claim of racial discrimination against them as disingenuous and he vowed never to work with the organisation again. On the Cricket Badger podcast last year, Michael Carberry said he thought racism is rife within the sport. Do you think all those stories and the, their recency of it have played a part in the general reaction? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, it's, it's impossible to separate these things and there is that creeping sense that I think all of us who work in the game feel that the game has got this wrong for, for too long. And to be honest, most of us knew about it, but probably hadn't done enough as, as journalists. And now there's articles all over the place uh, addressing these things, which is ex exactly right. And, and as he said, this should be the positive thing to come out of this kind of stuff. Um, so again, I, 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 I certainly had sympathy with Ollie Robinson on, on day one as it all came out, this kind of rise and fall happening simultaneously that he doesn't know about. I mean, I, I, it, was a, it was a shocking thing to watch. And I think it's hard as working in the game to separate Ollie Robinson, excellent medium fast bowler who had a superb test debut and all the other stuff. And anyone listening to the show last week would have heard my interview with him, some of which was quite prescient, the way he talked about his naivety at Yorkshire and the, and the stupid things he did. Um, he obviously didn't go into to exactly what, what he'd tweeted, um, but it all kind of matched up to a degree. Um, yeah, it's tough, but the, the, in order to get through it, it needs to be dealt with rationally. And I think any punishment that is dished out, I think whoever, the ECB need to think, what is this punishment going to feel like in six months, nine months, a year's time? Don't get caught up in the emotion of it now. I mean, to, on a different level, completely different thing, but Sandpaper Gate, for instance, I think most of us look back on the bans that were delivered to Steve Smith and Warner and Bancroft and think, well, that was as a result of the hysteria at the time. Look, this is obviously a much more serious issue, but again, let's not just cancel the bloke mm. uh, for something that he did, which was the tweets are abhorrent, but he has... He says he's a reformed character and I think he deserves a second chance to show that's the case. Do you expect him to play late in the summer? Or at least be I'd be amazed if he doesn't. 
Mm. I think he'll, I, mean, I think the, he's in pole position to play you, the Brisbane Test, even with all this going on. I, yeah. I think. Do you know what's inter- really interests me here? And this, is, and I, I've always had this this sort of feeling about various issues with with players, and uh, it's it's actually a, a side step away from the the tweets, etc. But uh, say, for example, throw out the name Kevin Peterson, right? Would Kevin Peterson have got away with half the stuff that Kevin Peterson got away with if he wasn't a brilliant player? Would the way that people are looking at Ollie Robinson be the same if he'd had an absolute nightmare at Lords? I mean, you know, it's it's a it's a stupid it's a stupid thought, I suppose. Mm. But in many ways, if he'd had a, if he'd played if he'd been very ordinary, and been left out, most people would have just gone, well, never mind, we've not lost anything. You know what I mean? And the and the wider point of why the the punishment is being made, meted out would have been would have been lost. Mm. Um, it's it certainly made it tougher to report on because he was in the game constantly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, so so all of this aside, and we can move on a little bit to to his cricket. How I mean, how well did he play given everything that was going on? I mean, if, you was, if, you, if you're looking for somebody that's got got a hide that's that's tough as a rhino and needs to be able to to put up with the pressures of the ashes. Oh God, I've mentioned the ashes. It's all right. How many minutes are we in? That's well, fine. that's about fifteen. Um, okay, you know. And he managed to perform that way in that test match beyond day one after he got off the field knowing what, not what had happened. You've got a guy that's kind of got, has got something about him, haven't you? I actually think that the two are linked. Um, <laughs> it's, difficult. it's difficult to say. I don't, I don't think that being a racist when you're younger makes you a great player when you're older, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, but he, you know, he spoke quite candidly before the test about how he was a little shit when he was at Yorkshire. He was, he was by all accounts, from his peers and from himself quite a horrible human being and in order to get to the stage where he could make an international test debut for England he had to turn his life around Mm -hmm. so you'd like to think that if he's managed to turn his life around in other aspects like his athleticism and the way in which he approaches the game and also just being in an environment where people want to be around him you'd like to think that he's also therefore turned his life around in terms of his views on racism, on sexism. And in order to go through that as well and come out the other end, you know, he's a pretty tough character. And I think that this, yeah, this only serves to make him stronger. Absolutely. Mm. Um, I can't remember a debut as good as that in quite mm. a long time, Joe. Were you, were you surprised by how well he bowled? Um, how well he bowled felt a bit of a sideshow. Yeah, to I know. The I know but there was a test. The there was holder. a test match that all um, raised. It's interesting. Not hugely. Um, partly from what I've seen in county cricket, which is, is not a huge amount, but it's enough to see that he's a bloody good bowler. Mm. But more from the way everyone else around the England camp talked about him. Um, the story goes that, he, that the batting unit basically said he had, he had to play that first test because he'd been that good and they'd seen him for up close for the best part of a year in bubbles. So no, I mean, also you, you, you never know how, quite how the numbers are going to translate from county cricket to test cricket. But the feeling was everything he did in county cricket was going to work in test cricket. Mm. Uh, and if there was any doubt that he was ready to be a test bowler, I think that the debut completely um, answered those questions. Mm. He, he outbowled both Anderson and Broad, not only just by sight, like by seeing him in the way in which the batters were playing him, but in all the metrics as well. Like his economy was lower than the more his wickets. Obviously, he got more he got more swing out of it. But also the thing that really really impressed me was that he pitched it up in a good length more than any other bowler. Apart, I think it was Colin de Gronholm was the only one from a New Zealand perspective who, who did it more at a good probing length. And to do that, I mean, I always think on your test debut when you've got a, a fast bowler coming in, if you look at the statistics, they often bowl a huge number of bumpers and short balls because it's almost like, oh, prove yourself that I can, I can play mm. at this level. Especially if he's 6'5 and, and Exactly, can bowl. but yeah. he resisted that. So he's obviously not only just extremely skillful, he's a, he's a really intelligent bowler. And I kind of feel like this time last year or the first test last year, we were all outraged at the fact that Broad had been dropped. Well, Broad's now vice captain and I think his place is probably the most tenuous in the side. Mm. So it's, I mean, on pitch alone, I think it's fascinating and I'm quite excited. Yeah, I, I thought it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, we talked about before how he was quite confident in how he was bit, quite public about the plans he had for set batsmen. And I don't know it's because I heard those comments, but I really did notice that he was working over batsmen. There's a spell. I know he didn't, I don't think he didn't get Kane Williamson out in the first innings, did he? Got Ross Taylor almost as he yeah. said he would get Kane Williamson. Yeah. In, yeah. The, in pretty much the same manner. But the way he was bowling to Kane Williamson in that first innings, like, I've not really seen Williamson struggle this much mm. against a bowler before. Um but what, what is it that he does so well? Because he, cause he kind of ambles in with no great pace. He doesn't really use his front arm hugely in his action. What, what is it that he does what, so well? Why, why is he so hard to face? Just, just from a watching him, 
in the in that test. I've only seen him sort of bowl, do bowl throughs, you know, live mm. um, before that. So when he was on the the Indian tour, and it can't, you know, the, the pitches you can't really tell because the ball ne- never seems to reach the keeper on those pitches on the sides of the on the sides of the square. <clears throat> but one thing that I noticed was that he he looks as though he holds on to the ball for a very long time. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that there's an enormous amount of height as he gets through the crease, and then his body is still moving forwards, and his arm is still back there like this. And so he seems to be able to let go of the ball. The perception is from watching it down the line on the television that he lets go of the ball from an enormous height and is able to kind of generate a lot of energy on it from that from a full length. Now, a lot of bowlers, when they run up and get it full, it's a little bit floaty, and you see guys getting on the front foot and driving them and pinging it back to mid-off and mid-on. But with him, the ball was always, was sort of snapping off the surface from a similar full length hmm. and going past the top half of the bat, you know, past the stickers. Um, you know, batsmen weren't comfortable getting out forward forward to him. It was a sort of, you know, McGrath is not the right comparison because he doesn't, he doesn't really bowl like him. Um, his action actually reminded me of, of, of a man from many, many moons ago, Paul Allert, his, his, his bowling action at times. I think he might be a little bit... Maybe a little bit snappier than Walt in his... Well, Walt is 60 now. <laughs> um, but so, so that's, that's what I noticed. Very, very clever in terms of using the angles on the crease, you know, moving batsmen around, you know, the, the, the off-stump guard thing that we've talked about a lot, batsmen batting way in front of the stumps. You always seem to be sort of um, probing that front pad plus getting a bit of movement. And he's not relying on swinging the ball. I mean, that's, that, that is a huge advantage when you know mm. that there are, there are tours with kookaburras and, and hard, flat pitches that you do not need the ball to swing in order to, to take wickets. So, mm. I mean, really good. I th- I, you know, again, just to go back to the, to, to the, to the nasty stuff for a second, I, I really hope he, that this stings like mad for him. Um, I, you know, the contrition side of it, all of that was great. Apparently you spoke in the dressing room. But this needs, this needs to, to sting for all of the people who have said for years and years and years that their treatment... Um, in terms of racism and all these types of things have, have made their lives misery, whether it be in the game or just anywhere. And the, the fact that he's very good and the fact that he will have an England career after this, it, I think shouldn't be in question, unless, of course, we find that there is more to be found. But I hope it really, really hurts and, and that there is, a, there is a pain and there is a judgment and there's something that lodges in, in his mind and other people's minds about their behaviour online and otherwise. Mm. Because otherwise, the whole thing would have been a massive waste. Um, you know, use it. He can use it in whatever way he wants once it's done. If he feels like he's been hard done by, so be it, or whatever. But this, but, but this stuff, for those people who, who have suffered from it, I'm, thankfully, I'm not one, but I've, I've spoken to quite a lot who, who are in the last couple of months. You know, I don't want them to feel as though, oh, well, because the guy was half decent, we're gonna, this all gets brushed under the carpet and we, and, 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 we, and we turn a blind eye and we move on exactly the same way as has been done for the last however many years. Mm. Well, that's where the light needs to be shined now. Yeah. Let's stop, you know, it's almost like you, want to draw, you don't want to be talking about Robinson, to be honest, anymore. You want to be talking about how we're going to get, make sure that everybody, so that they really do believe it's a game for all. Um, because I, I think it's, it's, it's hard to believe that right now. Hmm. but I hope it will soon fingers crossed um, on day five a lot of people got very annoyed at England's approach uh, New Zealand gave them 273 to win for about 70 overs and England basically blocked the crap out of it uh, some suggested England misread the mood of the room and they had a duty to entertain Joe did you have a problem with their approach I think I'm in a minority of one in not in that I didn't have a massive problem with it I thought um I thought they they could have given a bit a bit of a better go, but I think that's kind of right. either you go or you you don't go. Really, and I think if you've got Burns and Sibley as your openers and you tell them to block out the first whatever it is ten fifteen overs and then see where you get to, the likelihood is you're going to be a situation where you can't really chase it because mm. they're going to have gone that slowly. I also think there's a, there's a kind of a bit of a hypocrisy that we've talked about every Test match being really important, and then it seems like quite a lot of the same people are saying, well didn't really matter so we might as well it's have a good World game Test championship is it <laughs> exactly so i so I, I i still think that was an important test match that a draw against a very good side is actually a good result i think joe roots looked at his batting lineup and thought in those conditions on a tricky-ish pitch and a lot that many people have mastered mm. he didn't back his batting side to do that to, to pull off the chase and i think on balance that was actually the right call now he as i say they could have given it a slightly better go to see what opened up 
And it, it's frustrating to see that they didn't even do that. But I think on the whole, I can see where they're coming from. An important knock for Sibley as well, who's not actually played that much cricket this summer after a difficult winter as well. Um, Butch, the I want to hear what Butch, well, I want to hear that noise meant. Pardon? <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I had no, no thought to that. I thought the only team that could win the game when the declaration came was England. But I didn't think that it was likely that they would that they would mm. try. It was a, it was a really it was a really smart declaration from Kane Williamson. Not, in, a, ter- not in terms of setting up the game. It was just it was just smart. It was like it was a well, bit of a shitty declaration, we, we think, wasn't it? For we, we don't think we don't really think we can win this game. Yeah. But we're going to put the onus on them to try and yeah, win yeah. it instead. You know, it was it was there was yeah it it, was, there was a little bit of um, a little bit of impishness in that in the declaration. And given given England's travails given England sort of the players that they've got at the moment who are none of them in particularly sparkling form it was hardly surprising they didn't go after it you got Bracey and you didn't have Butler and Stokes coming in at six and seven yeah. five and six whatever it was the rest of them are all struggling it was very 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 it was a lot to expect that they were going to go out there and have a charge of the light brigade and probably you know probably then and end up losing the losing the match it reminds um, me of that Middlesex sorry game that was televised that you, that you covered. Yeah. The, the, the kind of way to chase that down is basically if the openers and the top orders are kind of bat normally and you just suddenly find yourself in a position where you, 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 you only lost yourself, two wickets. You get yourself... You can you, go you can't lose. a bit over. Exactly. exactly. You get yourself in a position where you can't lose and then you go out and have a bit of a dip. The, the only difference being that Middlesex absolutely had to win that game. Yeah. England have got another test match at Edgbaston where they traditionally perform exactly. a lot better than exactly. the Lords to win, to win the series. So, you know... It would have been and lovely. And that's an incredibly been... disciplined Kiwi attack. Mm. Yeah, well. I mean, that's they, the other, the other they thing. They are quite good. Is that, <laughs> yeah, for, uh, A, Test cricket's hard. B, New Zealand are world, num- world, world number one, are in the World Test Championship for a reason. Um, but also, haven't we for ages been saying, been criticising England for sort of coming off the pitch and going, well, that's the way we play? And, you know, gung ho attitude. Well, actually, maybe this is the better way to play in yeah, Test cricket? I, I do agree, but I do also think there's an element of them saying this is how we play just the yeah. opposite to the yeah, baby area it's good to be like, to the other end of the yeah, exactly. spectrum I know Phil was absolutely itching to say <laughs> it was a, a kind of monstrosity that they didn't go for this so I, I feel like actually I'm not in a minority of one I'm suddenly in no, the majority no, no, no. <laughs> no I think but I mean, if you're in the crowd <laughs> the neutral of course you'd, you know, we'd all have loved to have yeah. seen it happen yeah. I don't, when, they, when they declared it was quite unexpected at tea time or was yeah. it lunchtime tea time whenever it was you know there was definitely a sort of feeling in my stomach I was like oh this is great it, it, yeah. you know you wanted it to happen a, re- a realistic one would have been yeah. if it had set them to 240 in the same sort of time and then you sort of go okay well th- then you then you bait the opposition you're basically saying to them come on you know, <laughs> really, no, seriously <laughs> we're literally handing it to you on a plate here yeah. but that, i don't think that was i don't think that was ever kane williamson's yeah. what was thought it? I process think with the declaration it was it. literally if because if we bat out the rest of the day for a draw then we're going to get pelters so we'll just let them get pelters instead what was the score of the world cup finals at two four three or yeah. something i think someone <laughs> said that's when he should have declared yeah <laughs> um izzy you said that test cricket is really difficult um but devon conway didn't make it look that hard he batted so well on on, on day one um I know that we've talked in the in the past about how well he's dominated. He's like properly dominated domestic cricket. He's dominated mm. white international white ball cricket. But uh, to take that into Test cricket on day one at Lords against a decent England team, it's incredible, isn't it? Oh, it's freakish, absolutely. And I th- and I think that's that, that's kind of the beauty of Test cricket and debutants at Test cricket is that you never actually know whether they're going to be able to make it, so to speak, mm. or at least survive at that level until the feat happens. Um, and we've seen with Robinson, with Conway, like they have the mentality, the skills, the, the temperament, um, the experience as well. Both of them, I think, I mean, Robinson's 27, Conway is late 20s, yeah. early 30s, like, again, with a lot under his belt. So, oh, it was glorious to watch. Um, and, and to be honest, I was thinking about this the other day. Maybe Test cricket should just be an over 25s game. <laughs> no, it's like a blanket rule. You're not allowed to play until you're over 25. Yeah. Well, that's half the England team out then. Um, <laughs> And Joe, we should definitely mention 100 for Roy Burns, his first uh, for a while in, in a while for England. Um, team was good form for Surrey, but uh, he'd gone a quite a long time without a big baseball for England. Yeah, and also with James Bracey at seven, obviously didn't get any runs, literally any runs. But if he'd got some and one of the openers failed, which could still happen in the in the second test, then there mm. would potentially been some pressure on either Sibley or Burns for the India series. Uh, Burns batted beautifully. I have to say, I didn't. I was playing cricket on the Saturday, so I missed the bit where he didn't score any runs pretty much for a whole session. Uh, but then that was proven to be exactly the way to go because he managed to battle through that and 
and play some very unburns like well, shots that, towards the end as well. That sweep for six. That's amazing, was an amazing isn't it? shot. Yeah, Stokes um, S. Yeah, and I feel like we've we've probably given him a bit of stick on on the podcast. I think we've yeah. also given him praise when it's due, but um, I think it's absolutely worth saying. I mean, without that innings, England would have got thrashed in that Test match. Absolutely, he, he needed it. Mm. He needed it because you know, as, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned last week or the week before that. He always seems to be first head on the chopping block, mainly because people don't like watching him back. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, you know, he's a proven run scorer. Um, he'd missed out through injuries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and he just he needed a needed a score. Mm. Had a little bit of luck here and there, but he, he played really, really well. Um, he also kind of adds to the sort of late developer as well, because I think when he entered the Surrey first team in what 2012, 2013, it was a dressing room with a lot of big personalities. Uh, and very talented individuals as well. And he was his name wasn't really marked. It wasn't really like this guy's going to go on and 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 play for England, score loads and runs. It was like this guy could be a, a good county player. Yeah. Um, and he's had to really kind of prove himself. A on the county circuit. B at England and C in a very unconventional way. Um, but I talked to a few of his teammates who had gone had grown up with him. He scored his debut first class cent- or championship century with Aaron Haranaf. Is that right? Yeah back in the day and you know I think it was they all knew that his technique was really quite odd um, but just because it's odd doesn't mean it's nat- not natural mm. um, and I think we're seeing that now with the likes of Smith and Labashain and things is that you know if you let batters play naturally it doesn't matter how on earth they look that they they can capitalise and I think yeah he, he'll, his will be an interesting career going forward mm. I think with with him and Sibley our, our arguments particularly on this podcast probably seem quite kind of circular because when they're not when they don't look good they really don't look good mm. but we also both know they're capable of scoring test hundreds what Burns has got three Sibley also got three two, two. two yeah and, but maybe this is just what we have to accept I mean they've tried pretty much every opener in county cricket uh We've now seen that these guys can score test runs, but we also know that they're probably not at the standard they're going to do it prolifically over long periods of time. Mm. But that doesn't mean they're not worth their place in this side. Yeah. Until perhaps Hamid becomes such a like a pick that you just have to go for because he is probably that cut above in terms of quality. But but until you're at that point, I think maybe you just kind of accept what you've got and, and be as happy as you can be with that situation. I think that's a really valid point. I, al- I also think that they kind of get lumped together because of they're both not great on the eye to watch but I think Burns has I think I think he looks a lot more fluent in a very uh, ugly way yeah. almost than, than Sibley does I mean I think there are still questions about whether or not Sibley has probably enough scoring options at times I think he holds them back until he's like really really comes with the crease where I, I don't think Burns has that where Burns has moments where he does feel like he can dominate bowlers a little bit and I think we probably don't give him enough credit for that probably because of the aesthetics um we talk about the county championship um we are heading to the start of the blast so there's not that much county championship action for about a month um and it's very very tight in uh two of the three groups and still pretty pretty close in the other um i'll quickly run through what's happened in the last week or so uh back-to-back wins for leicestershire more runs for marcus harris and a 10 for for callum parkinson um, Somerset in, in a really important game against Hampshire um, interesting game they made a classic Somerset like recovery um, recovery from 43 for 5 to post 360 thanks to 100 from Lewis Gregory and 88 from Rolla van der Merwe at number 9 um, but also they batted for a weirdly long time in their third innings um, that kind of meant that the, the, the win was off the cards um, late on day 4 um, Glamorgan had an excellent win over Lancashire that, that really opened things up in group 3 Yorkshire who are second play Lancashire, who are top, and Northants, who are third in their last two games, so all to play for there. Elsewhere, there are impressive wins for Durham, Warwickshire, and Yorkshire, boosting their Division 1 prospects. Uh, There's a massive 100 for, for Dowd Milan um, in Yorkshire's Again. win over mm-hmm. Sussex. Um, Joe, your moment of the week wasn't that, but it was from that game. It was uh, Daniel Ibrahim uh, at Sussex, who became the youngest player to score a championship uh, half century ever. Wow. 16 years, 299 days, uh, right-handed all-rounder. He took a wicket, took, uh, bowled, I don't even bowled, dismissed Tom Coda Cadmore as well. And it's just the next, I mean, Ian Swalsbury, when I interviewed him a few weeks ago, said he's going to give youth a chance. And he certainly, <laughs> he <really is>. he <laughs> certainly stuck to his word. I think, if I'm right, I think he's given five first-class debuts this season and six teenagers have played. Um, the flip side of that is their bottom of their group, one win from eight. And, you know, Sussex 
are a side that have had success in the century, three county championships in, in quick succession, what, 15 years ago. So it's that balance. How, how, how patient will fans and management be? I can't and look, go about bringing up things from 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I mean, I think county fans love to see homegrown players yeah. playing for their county. So I think that does buy you quite a lot of time. But also no one likes to see their side lose. And, and Salisbury and James Kirtley, who's kind of, kind of a uh, co-head coach, who will look after the T20 side. Um, pitch to the management saying we know what is coming through the academy because we work with them we are going to play them all and this is our best chance to win silverware probably not in the next couple of years realistically not that they've said that themselves but four or five years down the line mm. they think that's the best way they can get in a strong position it's hard to argue with that um, wouldn't work in Premier League football yeah. management but in county cricket it might just work if everyone can be patient and and watch it all unfold. It is a big if, though. Sixty. I mean, lo- last year they, they gave a debut to James Coles as an all-rounder. Was he was here, also, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, he was also sixteen. Um, and I, did, I kind of think like you can't almost um, you almost forget how long it is between before they even get to like 21, 22, where they're yeah. still young players. So uh, well, they're still going to school as well. Yeah. So you can't just say right, well, you've got a season exactly because you, you have just a summer holiday. Yeah. Um, I spoke to Tom Haynes in the season, and he's he's only twenty two, and he's had a really good couple of years. He made his debut at 17 and he had a really, really difficult couple of years and now he's kind of got back into things and that's four or five years down the line. So I think it's very brave of them, that's for sure. And Salisbury um, will stick. I mean, you obviously know Salisbury very well, but he is speaking to him. He's kind of evangelical about this. Like he mm. really believes in it. And he, I mean, he took a lot of wickets when he was a youngster as well before he got his chance of England. So he thinks players should be given a chance and, and it's kind of sink or swim or at least even if it doesn't work initially, you're still growing as a cricketer. But it... Um, you know, it's it's risky mm. to a point. But it, it's, it's fine as long as they have, the county that is, has that long-term plan um, and and knows that there's going to be hard years in between. You know, you can write yourself into selection and out of selection mm. um, and that they have that investment and that commitment. And it does sound as though Sussex and Salisbury is talking the talk. Let's just see whether he walks the walk. I mean, it sounds like it. it sounds could, encouraging. Could be quite a long wait, though. Yeah, it could yeah, be, it yeah. could be. But that's, you know, cricket is not, yeah, that's the nature of cricket, isn't it? That's true. We not like long waits. That's true. Um, the, as I mentioned, the, the blast kicks off this week. Um, we should see a greater involvement from England players than we normally do. ESPN Cook Info's Matt Roller wrote today that uh, we could see the likes of Butler and Stokes actually playing more in the blast than the 100. Uh, quite a few England players haven't actually played in the blast for three or so years, but given... Uh, the schedule this year, given that the IPL lot haven't played the test series, some players who the multi-format guys are going to play first uh, blast action in quite a long time. Um, and also, finally on the blast, a reminder to sign up to the cricket draft powered <laughs> by Wisden before the deadline <laughs> on Wednesday afternoon. Head to fantasy.wisden.com to play. Uh, top tip ahead of game week one, you want to pick as many Hampshire players as you can because they're the only team to play three games in week one. Um, James Fuller was their leading run scorer in 2020. He'll also bowl a bit. He's, a, he's been picked up by fewer than 1% of players at the moment. So what's, what's the, the limit? Team. How many are you allowed to pick from one ca- from I'm one not team? sure. You're going to have to check that when, well, you, when you pick your squad. Right. Um, but you can pick as many players as you want in a squad. Um, and you, it, it's, you're not limited to 15. You can pick more to kind of uh, save you, I guess. Um, there's been another round of the Rachel Hayho Flint since our latest pod. Um, Northern Diamonds rolls Sunrise out for, for just 53. The South East Stars chase down 246 with ease against Western Storm. Um, there are big runs for Dunkley and Davidson Richards. Um, it was announced today that Dunkley has been given her first central contract uh, with England, so congratulations to her. Um, Lightning thumped the Thunder, runs for Tammy Bowman and Catherine Bryce. Um, I don't know, you might have seen the video of Alex Hartley taking a really, really good catch that she's been sharing a lot on social media. <laughs> Um, and the performance probably, or at least the moment of the round, probably came from Emily Arlott, who took four wickets in and over, including a hat-trick. And it was top-order wickets as well for the Sparks, who were top of the league over in their win over the Vipers. Um, moving on, Izzy, you wrote a brilliant piece in the upcoming magazine mm. on women's test cricket. Um, England play a test match at Bristol against India next week. In the last five years, there have only been two it's been seven years since a team other than England or Australia have played. Why has that happened? <laughs> I can't answer why. <laughs> um, but I can say that the, the women's test question 
is a really interesting one. And actually, the, the reason why I actually really enjoyed writing this piece in the end was because it started off with Joe sort of coming to me with a series of, I guess, his thoughts or questions. And I, I think, started off in quite a bullish approach. I was like, of course we want more test cricket. This is not fair that, w- that women can't play it and that men can the whole time and we're second-class citizens. And then you start to look at why there hasn't been as much women's test cricket. And it's essentially because there's been this sort of push by the ICC and therefore by the boards underneath the ICC to use T20 as a vehicle to kind of grow the women's game. And and it has. I mean, it's been really successful. If you look at the T20 World Cup final, if you look at the crowds we're seeing, the standalone tournaments, you know, WBBL is, is rivaling the men's BBL in Australia for viewing figures alone. So actually, sort of tactically speaking, it's quite a good idea. But there's still this... If you talk to the players, they all want to play, play test cricket. I want to play test cricket. You know, I want to play long fun cricket. I never got that chance. My, my hidden, my long lost calling was as a night watchman. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> um, and then there's also this thing that's always been, I found quite an irony as well, is that the fact that T20, which is a game built on power, speed, explosive forces, which men have better characteristics, but they're built better for it than women is the vehicle that we're using to promote a woman's sport when actually it's been increasingly recently like these records being broken in endurance sports by women. There's a lot to say that women could actually be better test cricketers in, in the long form game, whether it be for their, their sort of their mindset or their physical attributes. They could, if they were given the chance, really be genuinely magnificent test cricketers. So there's this, it's, it, there's no right answer. And mm. it was actually really interesting going to the ECB for their official line on women's test cricket. And it ended up me being about an hour long conversation with one of the representatives sort of where th- there wasn't really an official line because they don't not want it to happen, but equally they do want to endorse the ICC's line of playing as much T20 cricket <coughs> to, again, grow the women's game. And, and I think... Um, yes, it was you that talked about Lisa Stilaker's comments in a, a rival podcast, the Etcetera podcast by The Australian, where she sort of said that, that um, it might be the case that this generation of test women's cricketers who have played comparatively far fewer than her generation a decade ago kind of had to take one for the team, so to speak, to grow the game. And now we're getting to that point where the women's cricket it, it is breaking through. Mm. That, that maybe we can start seeing more of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's only half the story, to be honest. It's, 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 it's a really interesting conversation, I think, and there's, there's no right answer. I, I thought the most poignant line in the piece was you chatted to Heather Knight, England's captain, mm. for it, and she said, look, we're constantly told that test cricket is the pinnacle of the game. That's mm. what she's grown up being told. So for women not to play that form of the game kind of reinforces the idea that women's cricket is a, is a second-class yeah. sport. And... That is quite hard to challenge, I think. That doesn't mean they play test cricket all the time, but I think that is quite a strong argument to have. It's very powerful. uh, Yeah, at least more test cricket than is currently played. Mm. Has there been arguments made by boards that women's test cricket wouldn't make money? Is that part of the reason why? Because... if that is the case, there are men's test cricket yeah, that I mean, doesn't make money. I don't play. think these are arguments that are vocalised, but I think it's definitely one of the reasons. Yeah. It's def- you know, surely. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's unsustainable in that respect. And we've seen how hard it is in a pandemic for women to even just play cricket, yeah. let alone test cricket. Yeah. Um, so I think it's all part of the bigger picture, yeah. But the, but the context of this was that we have got two women's test yeah. matches coming up prior mm. to the Ashes test match early next year. So England playing India. Uh, it's next week, isn't it? I've yeah, yeah. Ne- my next dates. week, yeah. next Wednesday, I think it starts. Uh, and then, so India kind of surprisingly pulled two test matches out of the bag from nowhere, and then they're playing uh, Australia later in the year as well. Mm. So there is, this is why it kind of, we've, we've run it basically, mm. because it's suddenly ba- now back on the agenda when it felt maybe that it was almost becoming a, a bit of a non-story because it just wasn't going to happen. Mm. It does seem like there is now certainly a will to play a bit more of it, albeit it's probably just going to be among the top three for the time being. Mm. Do, do you think... When, when people uh, quite often talk about women's sport, not just women's cricket in the media, there is an emphasis on just growth and growth and growth. And mm. so do you think the balance has, has been slightly not not quite right in the last few years where it's all been focused on growth and actually, as Joe mentioned, you're not um, putting on what, what the players oh. themselves view as, as the... I think that's a really hard argument because it has grown. It's been mm. successful. Um, 
So I, I don't I don't know if I agree with that. Um, but equally, then you know, Susie Bates is arguably the best player, or has been in the last ten years at certain times, the best player in the world. Has never played a test. <laughs> Um, but then I'm also sitting here from the perspective of a rich, developed, test-playing nation as far as the men's nations are concerned. You know, I think a lot of our conversation on women's cricket, and I'm really mindful of this of recent, after having waded into Indian cricket recently, is that we talk in the context of England and Australia. And there are two teams, you know, T20 World Cup saw how sort of meritocratic that format could be, having Thailand there, for example. Mm. You know, there is a danger that by having more test cricket for some nations, you're just going to grow that gap between the developed nations and the non-developed nations as far as cricket is concerned. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, I kind of grudgingly almost agree with the ICC stance, but I think I'd probably sit with the ECB and sort of not have an official line on it and just hope that it's going to grow and come mm. back a bit more. Do you think it will? Yeah, I do. Um, and again, it's because I think that women could be really, really good at it. Mm. Um, and especially now that we're seeing in England, for example, um, that the domestic layer of, of cricket is becoming professional. And they've got the inverse problem to the, to the men, is that they, they literally haven't got enough cricket. Like they are, there is, they're training most of the time, I mean, the, much, much more than the guides are, um, um, as a proportion of their playing training. And so I think there'll be more red ball or more capacity for, the, for them at that level to play mm. it. And that's obviously a key ingredient for good test mm. cricket. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. From, from a practical point of view, ahead of the test match next week, how do you go about picking a side yeah. when there's so little red ball cricket? I mean, for, for England and India. You just have to look at it at every cricket that they played. Um, yeah. And then it's a bit like, you know, picking a test debutant in the men's. Like, we don't actually really know what they're going to be like until they step onto that pitch and play it. And it could be horrendous. Um, mm. But I think, you know, in England especially, that again, if you look at the, the new contract list, I think there was one change. Like, most of them have played a test already that they're going to look up to pick. Um, they've probably got quite a good sense. I mean, India are the ones that I feel quite sorry for. I mean, they're they're current Indian side the last time they played any red ball cricket or any long form cricket was three years ago and this is mm. domestically um, the last time they played a test was when they beat England in 2014 it's not to say they can't do it again mm. but um, that's tough that's tr tricky so it's you, you pick it on different metrics let's say than uh, past performances the, the key the key really is bowlers that can get people out who aren't trying to score at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and over and I mean that's the, the key for the men's game too yeah are there, you know, do, do England have bowlers who can remove batters who aren't looking to get out? Um, do India have the same? And that's, that, there, is, there is your challenge, I think, for Test Match Cricket for, for the girls, is, is that. It's that like selection goes back to being an art rather than a science. Yeah, a, a little bit, yeah. a little bit. And, you know, are there, are there enough players, given the, the sort of cricket that they, they spend most of their time playing, are there enough bowlers who have those skills to remove pe pe mm. remove players well no it's not, not right no. not right now um, there you go but, but so it's chicken and egg as well isn't it because mm. you need those bowl why produce those bowlers if you're not going to play well, the no, format it, entirely so, entirely so someone like Izzy Wong for instance mm. who thinks she might become the fastest uh, female bowler of all time yeah. that's a risky thing to go and do that in one, one day cricket like I mean if she goes and just bowls a load of <laughs> why is no balls and that, that's not they don't ever pick on. her to do that I mean you know no, I, mean, I think of two players all the time actually like of recent two if they're in the men's game I mean they've done very well for themselves but if they're in the men's game would have been you know sort of legends I think Kate Cross for example would have been in the sort of you know around that she's just kind of Anderson kind of bowler like she's a really skillful red bowler mm -hmm. um and then he, even Heather Knight, who mm. is one of the best players in the game, white ball cricket, but she was not a white ball cricketer when she came into the game. She, she actually made her name in Test cricket, which was astonishing, really, scoring that 150 against Australia a few, quite a few years back. But she's had to really adapt her game into white ball cricket because she, she knows that she's had to do it to survive. So, yeah, a lot of what ifs, certainly. Mm. Uh, well, that Test match gets underway next week at Bristol. So um, I think I'm going to that. So that should be, that should be good fun. Um, Izzy, what's your what's your moment of the week? I've gone back to my roots. Um, you might really have to explain your roots. My roots, okay. <laughs> my roots are I didn't come to England until I was eighteen because I spent a lot of that time in um, in the Netherlands. Uh, that's where I started playing cricket. Um, it's where my hero, uh, my first cricketing hero, Tim Delader, hails from, and um, I was very invested, therefore, in the uh, Netherlands against Ireland one-day series in which 
Netherlands went one nil up after a one run win, one run win um, in a very low scoring game, um, and then they lost quite easily to Ireland in the second. And they came back, and it was actually Stefan Myberg who was when I was I must have been. 16 he lived in my parent in our house our family house really? uh, for the summer because we were the resident english family and quite often the south african overseas that would come and play a lot in holland because of the similarities in language mm. um they he came and lived with us um and then max o'dowd was um my he played in my team we were in under 15s and things together he was confident then and confident now um he can hit the ball a bit far, further now but he could then and then of course tim delader's son bass delader is now a, a integral part of the team so i feel like it's uh yeah i'm really invested in them well i'm missing quite a lot of their regular players as well yeah yeah because they're playing sort of county championship mm. cricket and things um but uh van der guchten was the key player the key bowler um from glamorgan well from glamorgan no doubt but Glamorgan, i guess from holland um was the key bowler in the first in the first um ODR. and i think actually this is really important because again Ireland are quite a strong white ball side and we're starting to hear now of the icc's designs on uh, opening up um, or increasing the numbers of teams that are going to play in whether it be the 50 over or the t20 world cup in the future and of course women are playing now in the commonwealth games you know there are it's constant talk about the olympics like this is this is a really exciting time to be an associate nation an associate nation that's performing well mm. um so i think for holland they've had a really like quite tough sort of last half decade or so where they felt as though they were mixing with the big guys and then suddenly they were kind of shafted a bit mm. um, and then, and then you know, Ireland and Afghanistan getting test status and there's a little bit of like well, what, what about us and then mm. with, the, with Brexit and the, the cold part, you know, people making difficult decisions about whether they're going to play county cricket and I think it's yeah it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a while I think for mm. optimism in Dutch cricket and it feels like it's come back mm. And also, it, it, the ODI Super League is obviously my favourite competition and Netherlands uh, got, got themselves some points and actually aren't that far away from the qualification. Well, it was great, points. wasn't it, as well? Because I think it was the, the day four, three or four of the tests when it was washed out and you could just go and turn on the live stream. I, mean, I just sat there watching Holland. That, that was when they lost, but, you know. Um, the views for these streams are really high yeah. as well. The yeah, interest yeah, yeah, yeah. in associate cricket is really high. So you high. think they're going to pip England to a place no, in the World Cup, no, right? Isn't that what you said, Well, yes? Engl- England, Holland have a 100% yeah. record against England in T20s. When this is men, 2-0. Every time they played them at T20 cricket, they've won. So we're just going, we're just extrapolating from there. Netherlands also have a higher points per game than England in the current <laughs> ODI right. Super League. Um, England have also, orange is nine. such a great colour to wear as a supporter. <laughs> like, get behind them, Joe. <laughs> Um, but that was a nice little segue into uh, one of the, well, in a normal week, this would have been really big news, um, that there will be a 14-team World Cup from 2027 and 2031, which is quite a long way away, but that's good yeah. news, Butch. Terrific, yeah. I mean, you know, I remember the, the furore around uh, the, the announcement that it had been reduced, mm. um, particularly given the, sort of the, the decent showing that um, Scotland in particular made, I think, in the in the, the World Cup in Australia in 2015. It was a feeling, also in the in the qualifiers, that um, you know teams had kind of had really stepped up. But of course, they were all battling over over the last scraps to try and become the last. What was it? The last two teams mm. to get into the to the the 10 match World Cup in the UK. So it, it's welcome news, and it you know it kind of gives. You know, you can imagine being you're playing for the Netherlands, playing for for Scotland, playing for Ireland, even at times who kind of whose stock is perhaps not quite as high as, as it once were, and just thinking, you know, you you kind of go through all of the the, the qualifying periods, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you you're always fighting tooth and nail for for a bit of recognition, for enough fixtures against the big boys, etc., and and to end up with nothing at the end of every cycle, it's mm. pretty uh, it must be a pretty bitter pill to swallow. So it's great that they've uh, those four places are back again. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, and, and it. it justifies its own world cup i think fundamentally well, a little bit. Well. yeah 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 um, a little bit. yeah and and also i think you see the the, the inverted commas bigger countries play each other so often anyway the world cup is last time it was great obviously but it's just it's just a league season essentially a uh, league season packed into six seven weeks and um yeah i think having more teams is definitely a good thing i mean some of the most memorable world cup moments of all time have come from associate countries Beating the more established countries. Dwayne the Rock is the, the greatest moment of all time, isn't well, it? There, there, we dying, there, there we go. There we go. I mean, because there was a, I was a That's still pleased. my moment of the week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was pleased, but but surprised to be honest. I, I did fear that after the last tournament where Afghanistan pushed India close, didn't they? Yeah, in a and game. Pakistan. But they had a few. I mean, obviously England absolutely 
thrash them. Mm. Uh, and I wondered if the ICC might kind of use that for the fact they lost all their games sort of justification that, oh, well, if, if the 10th team can't win a game, well, should we add any more to it? So I'm really glad they haven't gone down that route because I think mm. that would have been... Uh, let's be honest, that was Afghanistan in conditions that don't suit them. Afghanistan in the subcontinent, I'm pretty sure would win a couple of games at a World Cup. Mm. Um, and most importantly... It doesn't really work if we just play amongst ourselves. Uh. 100%. 100%. Um, another bit of news from this week, there was a uh, contract dispute in Sri Lanka that briefly threatened the England tour later this summer, but that's all been resolved, which is good news. Um, and finally, Butch, do you, do you have a moment of the week? I, I have actually, yeah. Um, Sky Sports winning the BAFTA. Yes. For the coverage of the West Indies. Yes. It's obviously you know, day one of the the first test match all the way back in, uh, in the first lockdown, yeah. Um, which, yeah, I mean... Deservedly so, I guess it was it was a stunning piece of television. There was a bit of there was a bit of um, you know a bit of serendipity in it as well with the rain and the the add-ons that we got then from mm. from listening to Mikey etc. And I think it captured it captured a mood at the time and it, and and perhaps it propelled this conversation a lot further than um, than it might otherwise have been. So um, thoroughly well deserved. And poignant timing for it to be announced as well because it was it was on the evening um, when the Robinson stuff was kicking off and actually it was. <laughs> A good reminder mm. of what what this is all about. Yeah, um, yeah, hundred um, I, percent. I I quite often forget to do my moment of the week, but I've, I've, I'm going to remember to do mine today. Uh, I, was, I basically had a week off, so I was in Scotland. I didn't watch that much cricket, um, well, international cricket. But I watched uh, a club game between Grange Cricket Club and Royal High Castorfin. Grange is the scene of it, uh, Scotland's win over mm. England in 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, so me and actually like 40, 50 other people watching a nighttime T20 game there in, uh, in, the, in the glorious weather, which was a lovely way to spend an evening. Um, good, good club cricket good scene. Good break from Scotland. cricket you enjoyed yeah. then. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Very different scene though to the normal cricket we cover though. Um, anyway, I think that's everything we have planned to talk about in this show. Izzy, pleasure to have you on the show. Great to have you with us. But great as ever, Joe. Thanks for joining us. Cheers, yes. um, this has been the Wizarding Cricket Weekly Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, tell your friends. And if you really enjoyed it, why not leave us a five-star review on the podcast app. Cheers.